All right. Um, so this part can be a little bit tricky. We're going to do the abstract version first with this um, M in general form, and then we'll show specific numbers that give specific values. So if the start of this video is confusing to you, just like bear with me, we'll show some examples right after. Um, and this does form the basis for the uh, spring project. So, you know, you want to pay attention here. So I'm going to rewrite that M formula again, just so that it's on the screen when I'm talking about it. So we're thinking about the two roots, m1, m2, being negative lambda plus or minus the square root of lambda squared minus omega squared. And lambda and omega are calculated from our mass spring coefficient and damping coefficient. So given those values, you would have numbers for lambda and omega. And the thing we're going to wonder is, like, what kinds of roots do we get for different numbers that we plug in? So the easiest one to think about is um, if lambda equals zero, There is no real part, so um, the part out front goes away, and then in here we get 0 minus omega squared, so negative something squared gives us an imaginary number. And m is just going to be plus or minus i root omega squared. That's actually the example we did with the first spring. Um, so we're not going to do a specific example for that one. You can go back to that spring and see it. Uh, in that case, our omega was 8. And lambda was 0 because we didn't have a damping coefficient. If lambda is non-zero, then there are three different cases to consider. And they're all going to be related to what happens inside that square root. Does it give me imaginary numbers? So in the case where lambda squared minus omega squared might be less than 0, I'm going to get that the thing inside the square root is negative. So an imaginary number comes out of that square root. And m is going to be alpha plus or minus i beta for alpha equal to negative lambda and beta um, equal to the square root of the absolute value of lambda squared minus omega squared. Or you can think about that the square root of omega squared minus lambda squared. Um, the i is taking care of the fact that this is imaginary and we just need to calculate that um, value that it's going to take on. Um, and then that means that we have those complex roots. So x is going to take on solutions that look like uh, c1 e to alpha t cosine, I think I did first, beta t plus c2 e to alpha t sine beta t. Um, and then we can consider the opposite, where let's suppose lambda squared minus omega squared is positive. Um, in that case, the thing inside the square root is, sorry, positive. And what matters to us is that means it's a real number. Um, it's a real number that's, um, we're going to assume, oh no, we assumed it's bigger than zero. So then when I take minus lambda and I add or subtract that number from it, I'm definitely going to get two different roots. And instead of writing out that quadratic formula again, I'm just going to say they're m1, like when you add it, m2 when you take it away. 
So x is going to be like c1 e to m1t plus c2 e to m2t. Um, and then the third case is going to be between those two things. So suppose lambda squared minus omega squared equals zero, or lambda squared and omega squared are the same. Um, in this case, that back half drops off which means the plus or minus that gives us two different answers goes away. And we're actually going to only have one root. Um, and in this case, We're looking at the repeated root. Um, where x is going to be c1 e to mt plus c2 t e to mt. So from this one equation, we're able to come back and see those um, three different types of roots that can happen. Um, the base case that we started with, actually I'll point instead. The base case we started with, um, distinct roots, the repeated root case we did after that, and then the most recent complex root case we considered. And I know that this can be hard to look at, so I've got examples of these three things for us to kind of see how it happens. Um, pause if you're still writing, otherwise we're going to move on to those examples. So if we consider the differential equation, x double prime plus 2x prime plus 10x equal to 0. Um, just to get through this kind of quickly for you all, I'm not going to write out like the y, y prime, y double prime, because they're the same for all three of these cases, but I know that you're doing it, and you will continue to do that um, in, in the problems you work on where things actually change. So, we're going to get um, m squared e to mt plus 2 times the first derivative m e to mt plus 10 times our assumed solution e to mt. When we factor out the e, we get m squared plus 2m plus 10 e to mt. Um, and in this case, we're looking at auxiliary equation m squared plus 2m plus 10. And I can't think of a way to factor that, so I'm going to go ahead and put it into the quadratic formula. So m is going to be 1 over 2 times negative b, for us is 2, plus or minus root b is 2 squared minus 4 times c, which is 10, times a, which is 1. So it's 1 half times negative 2 plus or minus root 4 minus 40. And so already you can see this is, oh, no you can't because I turned the page. You can see that this is going to turn into one of those complex roots. Uh, we've got 1 half times negative 2 plus or minus root negative 36, 4 minus 40. And then the square root of 36 is 6, so that's just um, 6i. And finally, I'm just going to cancel out that 1 half, make it look a little bit nicer. I've got minus 1 plus or minus 3i is my root here. Um, so m is going to be that alpha plus beta i we talked about, where alpha is the real part and beta is the imaginary part. So I'm going to have um, that's negative 1 and that's 3. That gives me solutions that look like x is equal to e to um, 
alpha t, so minus 1t, there's where my alpha comes in. And then I've got those C1, C2 cosine terms. Um, C1 cosine of beta t, so 3 is my beta, plus C2 sine of beta t. And we wrote those solutions as like C1 e cosine C2 e sine. I just pulled out the e out front because it is in both terms, so you can do that. And I really wanted to highlight what these different terms are doing to our solutions. So this solution is going to look like this. As time goes on, um, you start with these oscillations, and they start to get more and more small. Um, they're kind of like trapped inside this exponential funnel. That's the damping term caused by the exponential. But then these cosines and sines that come out of the purely imaginary case as well, those are our oscillations. They're what the, makes the spring go back and forth. And then this is this damping part is the part that makes it eventually stop. Um, I've got two more cases I want to do. I'll try to go through them a bit more quickly because I know we're at um, 10 minutes. But hit pause if you need a break. And I'm going to keep going. So next up, we're going to consider x double prime plus 5x prime plus 4x equal to 0. <coughs> And in this case, um, when we plug into our ODE, we've got m squared e to mx for x double prime plus 5 times the first derivative m e to mx plus 4 times the original solution e to mx. And we always want to factor out that e. So we've got m squared plus 5m plus 4 e to mx. I'm so sorry, I switched to x's. I might have even done that on the last one. No, I was better on the previous problem. Those are t's. I'm sure you knew it, and you would have told me if you were here. Um, so, we want to solve the auxiliary equation. 0 is equal to m squared plus 5m plus 4. And in this case, I actually can see that it's going to be pretty easy to solve. Um, not like that, though. That would never give me what I need. Um, 4 times 1 is going to give me 4, and 4 plus 1 will give me 5. So I can factor this way. That means that m is minus 4, and m is minus 1. And so this is that simple case that we started with, where we have two distinct real roots, and so our solution is just a linear combination of exponentials. Um, when you add exponentials together, you just get a thing that looks like an exponential. So that's what we're going to have for this problem. Uh, where it sits might change with the C's. But, um, this spring is going to start from whatever position you give it, and then it's just going to be, it's all damping. It doesn't wiggle at all. It just heads down towards that resting position, zero, um, which it didn't get there where I drew it. But if time kept going on, it, it would get really, really close. So it's just two damping terms at different rates. And then I'm going to do the next example on the same page. I think I can do it. So for x double prime plus 8x prime plus 16x, we're going to be seeing that last case with the repeated roots. But we will work through the whole thing and make ourselves get there. So m squared e to mt plus 8m e to mt plus 16 e to mt. Or when we factor out the e's, we get m squared plus 8m. I'm going to go ahead and erase my picture. Plus 16 e to mt. 
So we've got the auxiliary equation m squared plus 8m plus 16, which I can factor as m plus 4 times m plus 4, because 4 times 4 is 16, and 4 plus 4 is 8. That means that I do have repeated roots, like I said we'd be thinking about. 2 repeated m equal minus 4s. And when we have that, we write our first solution the way it is. But our second solution we have to multiply by t to make it distinct from what came from the first copy of that root. So I'm seeing another damping term that E. And then the second term is a little bit more complicated. Um, it does have damping. So as time goes on, exponentials get really small. But it's weirdly balanced by this T, which um, as time goes on, that actually gets bigger. So um, it works opposite the damping. Sort of like it's going up while the exponential is going down. But exponentials are more powerful than um, just the letter by itself, so it still is always going to be going down um, as time goes on. So in this case, your pictures can look a little bit like this, where at the start that T can kind of compete with the exponential before all the damping kicks in and it um, goes towards the resting position. Um, so I know that was quite a long video and you all might not get to it the first time around, but you might want to revisit this when you start working on your project. And um, that's constant coefficient equations for you. So I'll see you in the next set of videos.